Good evening and welcome to Students Dominate Math. My name is Mr. Hendricks. And before we get started, we want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Happy Kwanzaa, and any other holidays out there that our listeners celebrate. We want to say God bless you and hope you have a wonderful holiday with your families. This is a live call-in interactive show brought to you through the facilities of Can TV, where you call a number 312-738-1060. And you uh, call in with your math questions, and I'll do the best that I can to answer them. In the meantime, what I have is a, a lot of things to talk about today. Uh, today today's show will be basically two, uh, focused in two different areas. The first area is we're going to talk about some statistic, excuse me, statistical analysis that I worked with with my students, things that I talked to them about in preparation for performing well in our tests and to share with them uh, how they performed on a, a, a recent test that they took. Uh, and also, I'd like to end the show where we just talk in general terms about some things in my experience, uh, some of the characteristics of some of the great teachers that I've had, and I'll t attempt to combine that with some of the uh, things that I think uh, all the teachers out there, all the educators out there, uh, characteristics that, um, some of the characteristics that we need to have in order to be successful with our students. If you have some ideas, if you, you'd like to add to the list that I've established, please call in to the number on the screen and share and contribute your thoughts. All right, so all that said, let's jump into some statistical work that I share with my students recently. This is the final exam time. The students took their final exam last week, uh, ex excuse me, this week, and um, I think the, a week before that, I shared this material here with them. All right, so let's take a look. All right, that's... Okay, let's see, let's tighten it up on this a little bit. Yeah, let's tighten it up on that a little bit. All right, so first thing that we shared with them is this is one of my classes. Uh, I believe this was, I believe this was my Algebra 1 class. And what this is here is called a stem leaf diagram where the prefix for all of their scores are here. So this nine means that the first number in their score was a nine, and these are all, this is the suffix of their score. So someone earned a 95. Someone here earned a 98. Uh, someone, another person earned a 93, and then this student earned a 93. Uh, some unfortunate scores down here. Uh, this prefix, uh, 53. Someone earned a 53. No one earned a 54 or 55 or 56 because you don't see a 4 or 5 or 6. All right, so I like this report because it really puts all of the scores of my students in a nice central location where I can see all of the scores that the students earn. It's called a stem leaf diagram. It's also a diagram that many of the students see on the standardized tests. So if we, as teachers, could um, share with the students how they perform, and also in doing that, you know, we're using this stem leaf diagram, you can also expose them to possibly something that they'll see down the road on a standardized test. All right. So after I, I had this stem leaf diagram with all of the scores in a central area, what I did was I listed each of these scores from least to greatest, from least to greatest um, here. So 46 was the lowest score, then 48, and then 53. So notice I listed all the scores out from the smallest to the, to the, to the greatest. 
It's uh, 62, 65, 67, on and on and on, all the way to the highest score, which I told you was a 98. All right, so all the scores are listed right here from 46 all the way to 98. I would zoom out, but sometimes I think the numbers get so small that if I were to zoom out, you can't really see that. You can't really see them. See, they're, they're so small that I don't think you can really see them, but I listed them all out. I listed them all out right here. So then what I did was after we have all the scores listed out from smallest to greatest, I have this formula here, this X bar. This X bar is something, it, it, it's the notation for what we call a mean. And X bar, uh, the way you get a mean is you take all of the scores from the least to the greatest. You add up all of those scores, and I did that. I got 1,664. All right, so I added all those up. You divide by the number of scores, and that gives you with a mean. Another word for the mean is average. So I divided and I got that average. So the average score was 75.6. This, this idea of an average is sometimes called a mean. All right, so then I've got another formula where I have something called the standard deviation. The standard deviation is it takes each um, this symbol here is it, it's summation symbol, and you're always um, after the summation symbol. They'll always ask. They'll always place something after the summation symbol that you're to add up. Well, in this case, we're adding the individual each individual score minus the mean. So the first score, the lowest score, is 46 minus the mean. And, oh, I meant to mention we also square that. So the first score minus the mean, we square. The second score, which was a 48 minus the mean, which is 75.6, we square that. The third score, which I told you was a 53, 53 minus the mean, we square that, and we go on and on and on. The next highest score, 62 minus the same mean, the mean does not change, square, okay? And you do, you do that consistently, you know, over and over and over again for each score, uh, each score that we have, all right? So it's a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers. Fortunately, we have calculators and different programs to do this, but I did that, and I, you take, you, you add all that up, and I did that here, and you divide that by the number of terms that you have. All right, so this is the, this 4,232 is the result of taking each individual score, each individual score minus the mean and squaring it. And I did that for all 22 scores. All right, and then I, that was the result. And then you divide by the number of scores that you're working with, you take the square root of all that and you ended up with a 15. You ended up with a standard deviation, one standard deviation is 15. All right. So standard deviation is important because you can have, you can have one class have an average of 75 and then a second class have an average of 75. And the two classes perform in a variety of different ways. You could have one class, their average was 75. But you have in that class, you have some students who earned 98, 99, 100. And then you have other students they will earn scores of 50, 52, and 53. Some scores are very high, some scores are very low. That class would have a higher standard deviation because 
the range of the data is rather significant, even though the average is 75. In another class, let's say a separate class, the class next door who took the same test and had the same average of 75, well, this class, their scores, some, someone earned a 75, someone earned a 74, someone earned a 76, someone earned a 77, someone earned a 73. All of those scores are centered around that 75. There's not that significant of a variation. There's not that wide range of scores that we experienced in the first class. Well, that standard deviation would be rather low. That, that standard de deviation would be rather small. So you can have one mean of 75 with a, with a large standard deviation. You would take the mean, you add one standard deviation. You take the mean, you subtract one standard deviation. And that would give you a general idea of the range of how your data is spread out across the mean. Versus another class, you take that mean, you add one standard deviation, which let's say is rather low, and uh, you subtract one standard deviation from that mean, um, standard deviation being rather low, it's going to create a very, very small interval where the majority of your data would lie. So this idea of standard deviation, we talk to our students about this. The test that my freshman just took, they had... Uh, they didn't have 22, 22 scores uh, from which to uh, analyze. They had maybe six. So they had to go through this process. We're trying to prepare the students to really, um, as I talk to professionals out here, um, they're really emphasizing this idea of uh, helping our students understand data, tendencies, and what's the likelihood that this is to happen, that's to happen? Very, 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 very important that our students are able to do things if they want to be successful in the areas of, um, uh, really all areas, but primarily business. Some of the business uh, professionals I talk to emphasize the importance of this. So, all of that said, uh, last thing I want to talk to you about uh, with regard to what we uh, work with with our students <clears throat> is when you list the data, uh, let me zoom out a little bit, when, when you show all the data listed out in order from the smallest score to the largest score, it's real easy to find what we call medians. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so what you do to find the median of this data is you find the middle score. And when you have 22 scores, like I do, there is no physical middle. So you take the middle of, or excuse me, you take the two middle scores, the actual physical middle scores, and you take the average of those scores. And in this case, you get a 77. The average of 76 and 77 is, is 76 and 78 is 77. So that is, my, um, that is my actual median of this data. And then what you do is you take this left half of this data, this lower half of the data, and you find the median of that. Well, here, that's 11. That's 11 pieces of data. So when you have 11 pieces of data, there is an actual middle score, a median. It's called a median score, which is a 67. And uh, I acknowledge the overall median here, and then I acknowledge the median of the lower half of the data right here. Put a 67 here. And then you want to find the median of the upper half, which, again, is an odd number of pieces of data. And there is actually a physical middle. In this case, it's 88. So you acknowledge that median there. And you put a, the lowest score, you put a point here. 
lowest score was 46. The highest score, you put a point here. And what, what you do is you draw a box between the median of the lower half, the overall median, and the median of the upper half. You draw a box with that, and then you draw lines from the, the median of the lower half to the lowest score the median of the upper half to the highest score, uh, those are called whiskers, and then this idea of a, uh, the result would be a box whisker um, diagram, which oftentimes is used to um, convey uh, data, which is what we try to do here. This is called the first quartile. Uh, this is called the first quartile, uh, second quartile, third quartile, so it really breaks this the scores up into quarters. Gives you an idea of overall how your students performed. Um, generally speaking, the box whisker diagram is based on medians, and then this idea of standard deviation is rooted in more of your focus on a distance from the mean. So, uh, that's all we're going to talk about with regard to st st statistical analysis. Um, it's what we really emphasized this, one of, the thing, one of the things we emphasized with our students this year at the freshman level. So, uh, one, uh, I'd like to end the show, and hopefully we can get some calls. You add to this list. I'd like to list some of the things that, I, in my view, uh, my experience with uh, working with students, things that have worked that um, uh, I would say are characteristics of what we um, would want our teachers, uh, different positive characteristics that uh, a lot of teachers have. All right, so I'm going to start the list out. Um, and you, again, you call in number 312-738-1060. If you'd like to add to this list, all right. So, my experience, uh, I'm going to put at the top of the list. I'm going to put at the top of this list, good parental involvement. Good parental involvement. Um, when I, when I. Um, when I have a parent who's involved, man, it really it really helps me out a lot, um, because the parent is is really um, passionate about this child learning. I'm passionate about the child learning, and a lot of times, even if that child is not passionate about learning, this positive positivity coming from multiple sources, my experience has been it really inspires the child, um, sometimes unwillingly, to perform at a higher level than they otherwise would have. Um, so uh, when, you, when you can talk to a parent and they see that you want the same thing for their child that they do, um, a lot of times it really assists you in the learning process. So Getting um, to meet the parents, talk to the parents, learn about the goals that the child has, goals that the parent has for the child. Um, and I, my experience has been that goes a long way to um, establishing a good rapport with the child and helping the child to perform at a high level. All right. Second thing, um, parent involvement, super, super important. Um, a never quit, a never quit mentality with the child. Uh, never quit. Uh, and that never quit could mean a variety of things. Never quit could mean a variety of things. I'm not going to quit on the child, and I'm not going to let that child quit on themselves. And this is very, very challenging. I'm telling you, this is very, very challenging. Oftentimes, as a teacher, you got to teach by faith. You have to 
you you can't see the child really understanding it because they're they they're, they're just sometimes they're very very weak in their fundamentals sometimes their attitude is not what it should so you have to see and sift beyond all that and really never quit on the child and again, that is very, very, very challenging sometimes. I'm being very transparent. It is very, very difficult sometimes with some of the behaviors that the students come with, some of the ability levels that the students come with. Um, your mentality might be, wow, this child is at a freshman level, sophomore level, junior level, and there are certain things that you as a teacher would expect them to know or have learned by that time, and if they don't learn it, and then on top of that, they don't show an interest in learning it, on top of that, they're fooling around in class and possibly being a distraction. Wow, sometimes this can get very, very frustrating. But the thing that I am encouraging uh, parents and educators, and I'm not saying that this is easy, but you never, ever quit. One of the great things when you've been teaching for a while, you run into students that uh, it was a super, it was a challenge not giving up. It, you know, they were goofing around or whatever, very immature, whatever the case might be. But they grow up. And man, when they grow up, they're a lot different than when they were young. So when you, when you observe this transformation, this change, it motivates you and it gives you the very tangible, uh, it gives you the very, very tangible in front of your face result of the commitment that you had in the past and it strengthens you and better prepares you to not quit on that young person you looking at right in your face. So um, I say all this to say, don't quit. You put forth your best effort with that child. You be able to look at them in the eye and you know without a shadow of a doubt, you can say to yourself, I did the best I could. And uh, this, is, uh, this is important. This is important. So never, ever quit. Uh, the, the, the first thing that I said was establish parental involvement and never quit. I think I'm getting long-winded, but that's okay. Um, I've got a list of 10 things, and I'm not going to be able to get through them all today. I think we'll pick this up next time. The last thing, the students are not going to like this, assign homework. Assign the children homework. In my opinion, I assign the children about a half an hour regularly, half an hour, 45 minutes but mostly like half an hour. That's, that's the intention on how long the homework should take. Homework is just practice. Anything you want to get good at, you have to practice at it. So that would be the third thing. Uh, and we'll pick this up next time because we only have a minute left. First thing, established, um, attempt to establish parental involvement. Uh, the second thing is never quit. Never quit. Just attempt to establish a never quit attitude with the student. You, and, and you actually don't quit on the student. Hey, if they need attention, give it to them. You encourage them to come after school. You, hey, applaud them. You know, I'm getting to some of, I'm getting to some of my other parts of my list. But, uh, and then uh, the last thing I said was give them homework. We'll pick this up next time. To all the students out there, like I said earlier, you never quit. You ask questions, you come after school, you put forth your best effort at all times. And if you do that, you will dominate math. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Kwanzaa to everybody out there, and God bless you, and have a good evening.